And so it would do like a disk seek for you know, 200,000 n-grams that it needed to look up for every sentence it would translate. Um, and so I said, oh, well, that, if you have really high quality translations, it'd be good to actually bring these into to real practice. And so we built a system that would serve um, an n-gram model. Basically, it kept statistics of how often every five word sequence occurred in two trillion tokens. And that gives you about 300 billion unique uh, five grams. And then we just would store that in memory on a bunch of machines. We'd look them up in parallel for the 100,000 things you need to translate a sentence. And uh, we came up with a, uh, an innovative new algorithm called stupid backoff <laughs> that kind of ignored the right mathematical thing to do uh, and did something much simpler so that when you looked up a five gram and there was no data there, you would just look up the four gram that was its prefix and use that if it was there. And if it wasn't there, you'd look up the three gram and so on. Uh, and that actually worked reasonably well compared to the fancier Neither nay smoothing, which is what you really want to do, uh, but is actually kind of computationally hard. Um, so, I mean, one lesson from this is simple techniques over large amounts of data are very effective. This has been a lesson throughout my, my career uh, that you can actually do very simple things and the data speaks when you do that. Um, then, uh, my colleague Tomasz Mikolov was interested in distributed representation. So instead of representing a word as a sort of a discrete thing, you want to represent it as a very high dimensional vector. So we're going to represent different words with different, say, 100 dimensional vectors. And through a training process, we're going to try to move words that appear in similar contexts nearer each other. And we're going to try to push apart words that appear in, in different contexts. Um, and if you sort of train over a very large amount of data with a relatively simple training objective that says, OK, if these things uh, are, appear in similar contexts, push them closer. And if they're different, push them apart. And you do that over trillions of tokens. Then you end up with uh, really nice properties where in this 100-dimensional space, right? 100-dimensional space is a hard thing to wrap your head around. Um, but in that high-dimensional space, things that are very similar end up near each other. So if you have mountain and hill and cliff, they will all tend to be kind of near each other in that high dimensional space. Uh, so points in space are interesting. But perhaps more interestingly, directions also are meaningful in this high dimensional space. Because there's a lot of different directions you can go in 100 dimensions. And it turns out that, it, for example, if you look at where king is in this space and you want to get to queen, you go in a certain direction. So you can compute that by subtracting the vector uh, king from queen, and that's the direction you go. Um, so it turns out that king minus queen, that's the direction, is roughly the same as the direction you would go to get from, from uh, man to woman. And so directions are meaningful, and different directions mean different things. So going from the present tense of a verb to the past tense is a different direction, regardless of what the verb is. Um, and so that says that there's a lot of power in these distributed representations. They're, they're encoding a lot of different kinds of information in the 100-dimensional vector that represents the word. <clears throat> then my colleagues, uh, Ilya, Oriel, and Kwok, uh, developed a model called sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning. And so basically, this used a neural network where you would have an input sequence. Uh, let's take the case of translation. So you put in an English sentence one word at a time. And the system kind of builds a representation from its own current state plus the new word that it's now seeing and updates that state to have now a, in the same way you have the, the distributed representations for an individual word, you now have a distributed representation for the sentence you've seen so far. And you can update it with a recurrent neural network called a long short-term memory. And then when you hit an end of sentence marker, you now train the model to spit out the correct, the, the translation of that sentence. So you have a bunch of training data, which is like an English sentence and a French sentence that mean the same thing. And you train the model when it sees this English sentence, it should spit out this French sentence. 
And you just repeat that process over large amounts of paired training data. And sure enough, um, you can use a neural encoder over this input sequence to initialize the state, which kind of gets you into the, I've now absorbed the input sentence, and I now want to decode a word at a time the correct translated sentence. And we're going to use that to initialize the state of the neural decoder. You scale this up, and it works. You get major improvements in translation accuracy. Um, Oriel and Kwok then published a workshop paper showing that instead of translation, you could use context for a multi-turn conversation. So basically, the sequence of interactions you've had with one person, or you know, one party, and then a computer model uh, responding, and then the other person, or the person then utters another response, and uh, there's multiple turns, that is your context. Previous, previous multi-turn interactions, and then you can train it to generate a good reply in, in, that, in the context of you know, the multiple turns of things that happened before. And it's the same model, basically. It's a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, but now the sequence is initialized with the context of all the, uh, the conversational turns that have happened. And it's possible, then, to have effective multi-turn interactions using a neural language model, which is pretty neat. Um, then a collection of other Google researchers plus an intern uh, came up with a model called the transformer. So remember, I said in this model, this is a recurrent model. So you have some state, you take the next token, and you do some processing to update the, the, the new state to have absorbed this token. And then you go on with that new state to absorb another token and update the state again. So that's a very sequential process, right? Because in order to absorb the, the third word, you need to have done the processing for the second word. In order to, to have done that for the second word, you need to have done the processing for the first word. That's not so great. Like, in computers, we like to do things in parallel, not in sequence, if we can, if we can get away with it. And so what this model did was say, we're going to just process a bunch of data in parallel, all the words in this input. And then we're going to attend to different pieces of it, rather than trying to have just a single state that we update sequentially going through the words. Um, and what that said was, don't try to force that state into a single distributed representation. Just save all the representations of all the you know, tokens or words that you've seen, and then attend to them. Like Pay attention to the parts that make sense to focus on when you're doing this, translating this part of the sentence or translating that part of the sentence. And you get higher accuracy with 10 to 100x less compute. So remember, I said all that stuff about computer hardware improving and specialized hardware. You know, that's giving us you know, large, significant improvements over time. But we're also seeing algorithmic improvements like this uh, also multiplying together with those improvements. And so you're seeing. Now, the ability to train through algorithmic advances plus machine learning hardware, much larger scale models, and you know, much more capable models because of that. Um, and so then a group of people uh, decided to train, uh, scale up and train on conversational style data using a transformer model instead of a recurrent model. And that gave you know, quite good results. And, in particular, a way of evaluating this so that it's uh, both sensible in what it responds and also specific. You don't want your chatbot to be overly vague, like, yeah, it's nice. You want it to actually say something sensible in response to, to what you, you interacted with it, because that makes it more engaging and useful. OK, so I talked about some of these, but there's been a progression of neural language models and also a progression of work in neural chatbots. Uh, you know, a neural conversational model, uh, MENA, uh, ChatGPT from OpenAI, uh, BARD, which we released about a year ago uh, at Google, uh, and then a progression of neural language models. So the sequence-to-sequence -sequence work I talked about, GPT-2 from OpenAI, which was, you know, some of these have parameter counts, which you can think of as a rough sense of the scale of the model. So one and a half billion parameters in 2019, the T5 work from Google, from some colleagues of mine, uh, 11 billion parameters, you know, very, very capable there. Oh, the transformer work I should mention, that underlies 
a lot of these, like the T here and the T here, that's all for transformer. So people have now really seen the advance in the transformer model and architecture, that 10 to 100x improvement in computation, and really move to using that as the, the basis of these, these large language models. Uh, GPT-3, uh, Gopher from uh, uh, some DeepMind colleagues, Palm from Google Research, uh, Chinchilla from DeepMind, Palm2 from Google Research, and then GPT-4 from OpenAI, and then Gemini, which is the, the project I co-lead with my colleague, Oriel Vignals. Uh, we have a large collection of people in lots of different uh, research offices working on building capable uh, multimodal models. So one of the things we wanted to do was move from not just a language-based model that understands text, but one that can deal with all the different modalities simultaneously, so you can feed it, you know, text plus an image, or you know, audio plus some text, and ask it to do something, and it will be able to sort of uh, fluently and coherently deal with whatever kinds of modalities you want to do. Give it. So our goal when we started this project about a year ago was train the world's best multimodal models and use them all across Google. Um, and so there's a blog about Gemini. There's a, you know, a website you can go to, and there's a tech report um, by the Gemini team, of which I'm a proud member. So Gemini was really multimodal from the beginning. So one of the things we did, as I mentioned, we didn't want to just deal with text. We wanted to deal with, with images and video and audio. And we turned that into a sequence of tokens that we then train a transformer-based model on. Uh, and then we have a couple of different decoding paths. One, we train to generate tokens uh, and that are textual. And then the other, we initialize a decoder with the state uh, that the transformer has learned. And then we can sort of go from that state to a full uh, you know, set of pixels for an image. Um, and we support interleaving these sequences of text. It's not like you give it a uh, text input and an image input. You can sort of interleave them for video. You might put in you know, a video frame and some text describing that, or, and then another video frame and some text, or the closed captions of the audio that's being said in the text, uh, and then have the transformer kind of use the, the fact that it's been exposed to all these modalities during training to now build common representations across all the different modalities you want to give it. Um, we have a few different sizes. So the V1 generation of Gemini comes in three different sizes. So Ultra is the kind of the largest scale uh, and most capable model we have. Pro is like a good size for running in a data center. Uh, and we use that in a lot of different product contexts. Uh, so like our, our BARD product, which has now been renamed Gemini, uh, confusingly. Um, <laughs> Uh, is uh, running on uh, the Pro model or the Ultra model we just announced last week. Uh, and then the Nano model, you actually want a lot of these machine learning models to be able to run on device, so on a small phone or a laptop. And the Nano model is very efficient for, for doing that and, and fits quite reasonably. You can quantize these things to make them even smaller uh, and so on. Um, so one of the things about our training infrastructure is we, we wanted to be able to have a very scalable fabric that can deal with, you know, you specify a very high level uh, description of the computation you want and then have a, a, a system that then maps that computation onto the available hardware you have. And so I mentioned we have these pods. And so for example, you might describe your computation as I have these two parts that I care about. I don't care where you put them and not let the underlying pathways uh, software system that we've built uh, decide where to put them. So it might decide to put this part on one pod and this part on another pod. And then it knows where the chips are located and what the topology and bandwidth is between them. So when this chip needs to communicate with that one, it'll use this link, the very high speed uh, network I mentioned. And when you need to have you know, this part of the model communicate over here, then it will go up to the data center network, which is you know, much less bandwidth um, to send data from one place to another but it kind of seamlessly happens, and the machine learning researcher or developer doesn't have to worry about it uh, from that perspective, other than just understanding there are different performance characteristics. Um, 
So one of the things about training large scale models is as you scale up, you know, failures will happen. You'll, a machine will die, one of the TPU chips will you know, overheat and, and start to malfunction in some way. Uh, and so minimizing failures is really important. Uh, some of those failures you want to minimize can be almost human self-inflicted things. So for example, we had a, a sweeping way of upgrading kernels on our machines, which is a perfectly fine approach if those machines are kind of independent computations. But if they're all part of the same you know, thousand machine computation, you actually would prefer to take the machines down, upgrade all 1,000 kernels simultaneously, and then bring them back up rather than having rolling failures throughout. So we kind of optimize some of our repair and, and upgrade processes. Uh, but you also, once you've done that, you then want to minimize the time to recover. Uh, because the faster you, you uh, can recover, the, the sooner you can actually be making uh, useful forward progress. And so we have a a metric we call good put, which is the percentage of time that model training is actually making useful forward progress, uh, as opposed to recovering from a checkpoint or waiting for some other part of the system to be started. And one of the things we, we use is rapid recovery from other copies of the model state from memory in those other machines, rather than going to a distributed file system to recover from a checkpoint. And that you know, makes the recovery time you know, a matter of a few five to 10 seconds rather than several minutes. <clears throat> uh, in terms of training data, you know, we want this model to be multimodal, so we want to train it on a large collection of web documents, you know, various kinds of books, uh, various kinds of code in lots of different programming languages, plus images, audio, and video data. Um, we have heuristics for filtering those data sets. Uh, some of them are kind of handwritten heuristics. Some are model-based classifiers of, like, do we think this is a high-quality document in various ways? Um, the final mixtures uh, of the training data are determined through ablations on smaller models. So we'll run smaller-scale models with different mixes. Should we use 32% code or 27% code? And then evaluate the performance on a wide range of metrics to, to better understand that. Uh, we've done some things like increase the weight of domain-relevant data towards the end of training, so we want to enrich it with, say, more multilingual data towards the end of training uh, in order to make the multilingual capabilities improve. I do think data quality is a really interesting and important research area, um, and I think it's, we've seen that you know, having really high-quality data makes a huge difference in the performance of the model on tasks you care about. And so that means, you know, in some sense, that's as important or even more important in some cases than the actual, say, model architecture you're using. Um, and, and so, you know, I think it's a pretty important area for future research. You know, having the ability to learn curriculums automatically seems important. Uh, identifying high quality examples uh, and, and low quality examples and so on. And then there's been a bunch of advances in not only training these models, but also how do you elicit the best qualities of the model? How do you actually ask questions in a way that causes the model to be able to answer questions in a more effective way? Um, so for example, asking models to show their work improves the accuracy of the model and also the interpretability. Uh, and so some of my colleagues came up with a technique called chain of thought prompting. Uh, so you, if you remember back to third grade math class, your, your teacher would always encourage you to show your work, right? And the reason they want to do that is both to see your thought process in getting to the answer, but also to kind of encourage you to think about, you know, what are the next steps and how am I going to break this complicated problem down into a smaller set of, of steps. And so if you ask a model, you know, give it, you, usually you give it an example of a kind of question you wanted to answer, and then the actual answer for that question, and then you ask it a new question, and then you ask it to answer that question. And so here's an example of a question, and, and then the way the model was taught to respond is just to figure the answer out and give it, um, and then there's a, more, there's a different question, and the model output actually says the answer is 50, which is wrong. But if you instead ask the model and show, demonstrate to it, you know, how do you show your work, um, and you say, okay, well, Sean started with five toys. If you got two toys each, then that is four more toys. Five plus four is nine, so the answer is nine. 
That's, that's the work your, your third grade math teacher would be really proud of. Um, and more importantly, if you do that, the model actually you know, elicits these sort of more incremental steps to get to the answer, and it gets it right because it's now had longer to think about the, the steps, to basically more time to think about through the steps of, of uh, getting to the right answer. Uh, and so that's actually, and it's a pretty dramatic effect, right? These two, these two lines are the same underlying models at different scales. And what you see, these are two different math, sort of mathematical oriented benchmarks. Uh, the one on the right is sort of eighth grade math problems, and this one is you know, a bunch of arithmetic problems. What you see is the quality of responses is pretty bad when you just give it st standard prompting. But at some point, the model scale becomes large enough that all of a sudden when you ask it with chain of thought prompting, your accuracy shoots up quite a lot. So that says there's a really interesting science of how you ask these models questions in a way that actually you know, both makes them more interpretable and also more likely to give you the right answer. OK, so let's talk about multimodal reasoning in a Gemini model. And I think a, an example is a nice one. It's a good way to understand what this model can do. So here's the prompt. You know, here's a solution to a physics problem by a student. And then there's just a, a, a picture of the problem and the student's written out answer in kind of handwriting. And then the rest of the prompt says, try to reason about the question step by step. That's, again, kind of the chain of thought prompting style thing. Did the student get the correct answer? If it's wrong, please explain what's wrong and solve the problem. And make sure to use LaTeX for math and round off the final answer to two decimal places. And so that's the input, this kind of like hokey image of handwriting and a skier going down a slope and all this kind of stuff, conservation of energy, blah, blah, blah. And then this is the output of the model. So the student get, didn't get the correct answer. The student made a mistake in the calculation of potential energy at the start of the slope. Um, the potential energy at the start is given by MGH. The student used the length of the slope, I guess that's the hypotenuse, instead of the height in the calculation. The correct solution is, you know, it means the total blah, blah, blah. Therefore, we can write. This is, re this is actually in LaTeX, but we've rendered it for your reading convenience. Uh, and substituting the values, there it is. It worked the problem out to two decimal places. So think about what this means. All of a sudden, we can give models like kind of multimodal input, you know, a complex, you know, a picture of a whiteboard and a problem and ask it to do something and it can do it. You know, it's not always going to do it right, but, but it can. And uh, this can be an amazing educational tool. So think about, you know, a student trying to work things out on their own and they're taking pictures of their solution and, and you know, the system is kind of helping, helping them figure out what they did wrong. Um, we know that individualized tutoring has outcomes that are two standard deviations higher when you have a one-on-one -on -one human tutor for education than when you have a much uh, broader scale classroom setting. So could we get close to that in terms of having individualized uh, tutoring? I think, I think that, that possibility is within our collective grasp. Um, okay, so evaluation, you know, that was kind of a, a uh, qualitative example of Gemini's capabilities, but it's also good to look at how it compares on a bunch of different uh, characteristics. Um, evaluation, you know, really helps us identify the model strengths and weaknesses, helps understand, you know, is training going well? So we're constantly evaluating these metrics as we're training the model. Um, helps us make decisions about what to change. Is our math performance, you know, lower than we would hope? And so maybe we should enrich the training mixture with more math-oriented data what will that do to multilingual performance? Um, there's a lot of complicated trade-offs, some of which you make at the beginning of training, some of which you're kind of monitoring online and trying to make uh, principled or seat of the pants decisions, I guess. Um, and helps you compare the capabilities to other models and systems. Um, and so the high, highest level summary is, you know, we looked at 32 academic benchmarks uh, and the Gemini Ultra model exceeded the state-of-the-art performance in 30 of the 32. Um, and so if we look at and delve into some of these in, in depth, uh, there's a bunch of text-oriented or general reasoning or math-oriented benchmarks. Um, and if you compare Gemini Ultra with GPT-4, which is generally the, 
the prior state of the art in most of these problems, uh, what you see is uh, the ones in blue is the state of the art. And so we, we state of the art on seven of the eight. Uh, the 90% on MMLU is interesting because this is a very broad uh, set of questions in 57 different subjects. You know, chemistry, math, uh, international law, philosophy. Um, and the group that put together the, the benchmark um, <clears throat> measured human expert level performance at 89.6%, I think, or maybe 89.8. And so this actually exceeds human expert level performance in these 57 categories, uh, which, is, which is quite nice. We're happy with that. Uh, and then there's a bunch of coding-related ones down here and math-oriented ones here. Uh, yeah, I mentioned the 90%. So if you look at image understanding benchmarks, you know, these are now getting into the multimodal aspect of this. You know, we uh, got state-of-the-art results on eight of eight benchmarks, ranging from uh, one of the nice things uh, was this benchmark came out a week before we published our paper, uh, and we'd never seen it before. So we, our eval team quickly added this benchmark to our eval set and discovered that we exceeded the state-of-the-art results uh, by a you know, reasonable margin, uh, which was nice. It's, it's always nice when you have a, a benchmark you've never seen before and you do well on it, uh, because you're always worried about like, leakage of, of test date, training data into the test set and so on. Um, <clears throat> if you look at video understanding, you know, again, the multimodal capabilities of, of this model really really shine pretty well, state-of-the-art on six of, six of six uh, benchmarks, including you know, the important English cooking video captioning benchmark uh, and video question answering and so on. Um, and if you look at audio, you know, the word error rates of, of this on a bunch of diff four different uh, uh, public uh, uh, speech recognition benchmarks, as well as a speech translation benchmark state-of-the-art on 505, and multilingual capabilities are, are quite good. We're state-of-the-art on four of the five. So yeah, first, I hope you appreciate our eval team, because this is a tremendous amount of work to evaluate these models and really understand the capabilities in this level of detail, and uh, that's uh, pretty, pretty awesome. Um, and it does give us a, a nice, firm idea that the, the Gemini model is pretty capable uh, and we also have, you know, measurements of pro and nano in the paper. Okay, so these large transformer models can actually generate uh, surprisingly coherent conversations, uh, which is kind of the, the evolution of that sort of neural conversational model and then the transformer-based versions of those. Um, so if you look at bar. I guess I have to update my slides. So uh, this will be gemini.google.com. Um, so the, I was actually preparing a talk before we were using Gemini models uh, a, a few months ago in BARD, uh, Gemini. Uh, and I said, you know, reverse the letters of hot chips and tensor processing units for me. So, you know, just to show what these models could do. And it says, sure, the reverse strings are, you know, there they are. Great. But then it went on to say, I can also do this for you in Python. <laughs> Here's the code. Uh, you know, define reverse string as a function. Here's the string. Print reverse string of that, reverse string of that. Uh, use code with caution. I always recommend that. Um, and then it also goes on to explain it. For code first defines a function called reverse string, takes a string as input, returns a reverse string. Function works by looping through the string. Code then prints reversing. And it's always going to be helpful. Is there anything else I can help you with? Um, so this is pretty amazing, right? Like the fact that someone asked a question and it did what it was asked, but then it also said, by the way, here's this thing called programming and some Python code, uh, and here's, what it, here's how you would do this, uh, write, writing you know, code to do this. I, I think that's pretty cool. And then again, a real educational opportunity. Um, is there anything else you can help me with? Sure, tell me more about TPUs. So, you know, the model has a fair amount of world knowledge. It knows that TPUs are, you know, basically I, I've told you a lot of this. They're specialized hardware processors developed by Google to accelerate machine learning. They can help improve the efficiency and performance. Uh, here are some of the benefits, faster training inference. I hope, again, I hope this helps. <laughs> um, 
And, and you know, I think one of the kind of fun things about these chatbots is they can have different kinds of personalities. Right? The Bard is sort of your helpful friend and will help you answer lots of questions. Uh, so we actually put Gemini Pro in Bard uh, in slash Gemini uh, last month. And there's a uh, public site called LMSYS that can evaluate different chat agents, because there's now a lot of different chatbots in the world. And the way they do that is they get users to write their own prompt. They pick two random chatbots that they have configured in their system. And then they send the query to both of them, the prompt to both of them, show, and then show the output anonymized. So you just say, which is better, the left or the right? Um, and then from that, you can compute what's called an ELO score. So ELO was, a, I believe, a Hungarian uh, mathematician who was trying to develop ways to rank uh, chess players. And so when you have a tournament, um, basically you get more ELO points when, when you defeat uh, one opponent. And so you can, in a tournament setting, uh, compute an ELO score. And roughly an ELO score being higher by 100 means that the stronger competitor will win 64% of the time. And 400 points is meant to be a 10 to 1 advantage. And so the, the, the pro level uh, model actually achieves the second highest uh, ELO score in this thing. And there's probably like 30 different models. I'm showing the top of the leaderboard, uh, which is pretty nice. Uh, so this is like a free service. Uh, and these ones are, are not. <laughs> and so I tweeted about this. And then this person, who I'd never seen, said, it's actually it's really pretty good. Check out this example. And you know, we, have, we have a way for people to share their interactions with Bard that they liked and they actually want to make public. And so he, he decided to do that. So if you click on that, he was asking about, please estimate the number of companies per million residents in each of the following countries, the US, England, South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore, present your numbers in table form. And so Gemini said, absolutely, here's a table showing the number of blah, blah, blah. There it is, the number of companies per million, just as he asked. As you can see, England has the highest number, and it sort of interprets the results for you, too. England has the highest number, followed by the US, South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore. It's important to note these are just estimates. The actual number may vary depending on source and definition. I hope this helps. Let me know if you have any other questions. Um, and so he went on to say, you know, where'd you find the numbers for the companies? Oh, I apologize for not providing the sources. Um, it's important to be transparent where information comes from. So the company numbers I used came from a combination of different sources. So for the US, they used the Dun & Bradstreet database. Uh, England, I used the Office of National Statistics, blah, 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 blah. Please note these sources have somewhat different definitions. So it actually understands the subtleties, right? Like the, there's different definitions of what constitutes a company, and it sort of knew where to go off and, and get all this uh, different kind of sources of data. It didn't have that memorized, but it was able to make use of it. Um, pretty neat. OK, and another trend I think is important is that uh, um, Further refinement of these general models can make amazing domain-specific models. So some of my colleagues took some of our earlier work on the Palm model and then the Palm 2 model, which was a general purpose model kind of like uh, trained on general text, and decided to enrich it and further train it on medical data, so medical kind of questions and medical articles. And what they found was the MedPalm model, the first one, actually exceeded the medical passing mark for the medical boards. And that when you then, six months later, they trained it on the, med, the Palm 2 model to do MedPalm 2, they actually got expert level performance on the medical boards uh, for this particular task. Now, this is not a full general purpose uh, setting. It's like a bunch of medical questions. But it does show the capabilities of having a really capable general model and then training it in a domain-specific way for specific uh, problems. OK, uh, I'm going to go quickly through generative models uh, producing images and video. You've probably seen this as a trend in the world. So we have a couple of different research projects, uh, Party and Imagine, 
Uh, and you know, one of the kind of cool things I mentioned, you can give prompts that describe what you want in visual imagery and then have models that can generate these, these images that are kind of constrained by the encoding representation of processing the sentence. And then conditioned on that, it will generate pixels for an image. So a steam train passes through a grand library, oil painting in the style of Rembrandt. There you go. Uh, a giant cobra snake made from X, where X might be corn, pancakes, sushi, or salad. <laughs> Which is your favorite? I, I kind of like the, the ferocious lettuce looking <laughs> snake. But the corn one is pretty nice too. Um, you know, a photo of a living room with a white couch and a fireplace, an abstract painting is on the wall, and bright light comes through the windows. So if you happen to need a picture like that for, for a presentation or something, like I did, you can uh, do that. And it can be pretty detailed descriptions. You know, a high contrast photo of a panda riding a horse, panda's wearing a wizard hat and reading a book, the horse is standing on a street against a gray concrete wall, colorful flowers and the word peace, you know, blah, 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 DLSR, DSLR, photograph, daytime lighting. And there you go. You know, there are many plausible interpretations of that, but at least you got one example of what you, what you asked for. Um, and this is now integrated into BARD. So the uh, K through 12 uh, government uh, school agency in Illinois uh, was really excited about being able to create images of their mascot, Hyperlink the Hedgehog. Um, so there's Hyperlink surfing, riding this AI wave. Uh, and this person was very excited about, you know, the prompt was a human buying coffee at Costa Coffee in, in London. Uh, Costa Coffee is a very popular coffee chain. Um, and one of the things that these models have often struggled with is the fidelity of text. Uh, actually, you know, putting the text you asked for, making it look like a real font, and so on. And here you see it does, does a pretty good job. Um, I won't talk through a lot of the details, but essentially, you know, you put in a prompt that gives you a representation of what that sentence in a distributed vector-based setting is, and then conditioned on that, the model is trained to generate first a small scale image, and then take uh, another a model that is designed to improve the increase the resolution of an image, uh, conditioned on both that lower scale, lower resolution image, plus the text embedding. And then we apply that one more time with the larger image and the condition on the text embedding to produce the full scale 1024 by 1024 image. Um, and you can really see the effects of scale. So if we train four different models uh, with 350 million to 20 billion parameters, um, and then given them the same prompt, you know, a portrait photo of a kangaroo wearing an orange hoodie and blue sunglasses standing on the grass in front of the Sydney Opera House, holding a sign in the chest that says, welcome friends. Um, what you see is, you know, it kind of got the kangaroo aspect at the smallest scale, but not, and the orange hoodie, I guess, but not much else. There is a sign, but it's, you know, again, not, it struggled with text, let's say. Uh, as you scale up a bit more, the kangaroo got a little better. It now knows a bit more that Sydney Opera House looks something like that, but it's kind of a little chunky and doesn't have a lot of detail. Uh, it, it's closer to welcome friends, uh, but it might be veg me hee hee, I'm not sure. <laughs> but then as you scale up, you now get a pretty nice image of the Sydney Opera House and your kangaroo in the orange hoodie with the right text. So you see scale is, is an important aspect of this. And this is why you're seeing all these advances in you know, the last decade is essentially scale and better training methods and algorithms really contribute to higher quality results. This graph just effectively says the same thing, but I think the kangaroo says it better. <clears throat> um, I think it's also important to realize that there's a lot of machine learning uh, kind of invisibly helping people in various ways, uh, and particularly on phones. So, you know, a lot of camera features in modern smartphones have gotten significantly better over the years through combinations of computational photography methods and machine learning methods uh, together. You know, so portrait mode where you make the background all blurry so you look 
all fancy in the foreground um, is a nice, nice technique for some of these uh, portrait style photos. Uh, night sight, where you're trying to take an image in very low light conditions, you can essentially take lots of readings from the sensor and integrate those in, in software to create you know, much higher uh, lighting conditions than the actual conditions under which you did that. That also helps you take better astrophotography. And portrait blur and color pop are nice features sometimes when you want them. Um, magic eraser, so if you actually understand images and you point at like one of the telephone poles and says make and say make these go away, then the system can do that. Maybe your waterfall photo had these, you know, uh, other tourists in front of it and you didn't want them there. You can you can erase them. Uh, there they go. Um, and there's a lot of features on the phone, and many of them are sort of about how do you transform one modality into another. Uh, you know, so sometimes uh, you want to be able to say screen a call. Uh, so maybe you don't want to actually answer your phone, but have a, a computer-generated voice answer the phone for you, ask what the person's calling about, and then give you a transcript of what they said. Uh, and then you can decide, you know, do I want to accept this phone call or not? Um, you know, hold for me can kind of listen on the phone for you, so you don't have to hold, uh, hold on Bank of America when you're calling their customer support. Live caption can show, can take any video playing on your phone and listen to the audio and then give you transcripts, uh, captions of what's being there. Maybe you're trying to watch a video in a lecture hall like this and you don't want the audio to disturb people. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of cool, cool features of this and a lot of these are running on people's phones without them necessarily realizing it or thinking about what technology is under there. Um, and this has amazing uh, advances for, for uh, sort of people in limited literacy settings. You know, you can point your camera at something and it can read you what you're pointing it at or maybe you don't speak that language and you're trying to understand it, it can, it can read it and translate it for you. Um, I think I'm gonna go quickly here and maybe skip some of this section. Uh, I will just skip over some of this. But there's a pretty awesome advances in uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll start here. You know, I think material science is a pretty interesting area where, you know, basically machine learning is starting to influence lots and lots of aspects of, of science, um, both through kind of automated explorations of interesting parts of the scientific uh, hypothesis space or through, you know, creation of very rapid simulators that are learned rather than sort of traditional high, high large, large scale kind of HPC style computation. You know, in some areas, you've been able to learn a simulator that is uh, sort of the functional equivalent of a hand coded simulator, but is now 100,000 times faster. And so that means that all of a sudden you can, you know, search a space of 10 million possible chemicals or materials and identify ones that are interesting and promising and have certain properties. Uh, that you would normally have to apply a lot more compute for. Uh, and so some of my DeepMind colleagues uh, were actually looking at uh, interesting ways of searching the space of possible materials for those with interesting uh, 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 properties. So they have a structural pipeline that can you know, represent a potential material as a graphical neural network, and then a compositional pipeline that can sort of mutate sort of known structures into ones that are sort of interesting and adjacent, and then uh, use an existing database of materials to then be able to output <laughs> energy models and a bunch of stable, uh, interesting possible compounds. Uh, and so this automated discovery of 2.2 million new crystal structures uh, leads to a bunch of interesting, you know, possible candidates for actual uh, synthesis in the in the lab to see what properties they actually have. And I think there's huge potential for using machine learning in all aspects of healthcare. Um, really, uh, we've been doing a fair amount of work in the space of medical imaging and diagnostics uh, for quite a while. Uh, and those problems range from ones where you have 2D images to some, some where you have sort of 3D volumes from uh, MRIs or other kinds of 3D CT scans. Um, and then some where you have just a single view to ones where you have multiple views and 
and large images, uh, very high resolution things for pathology, for example. Um, and so there's been a, a fair body of work. I'm going to talk briefly about two of them, though. Uh, so one of the areas we've been working in the longest in this space uh, is the area of diabetic retinopathy. And so diabetic retinopathy is a, is a degenerative eye disease that can, um, you know, if you catch it in time, is very treatable. But if you don't, uh, you can suffer full or partial vision loss. And really, people who are at risk, which is sort of anyone uh, with diabetes or prediabetes, should be screened every year. But in a lot of parts of the world, there just aren't enough ophthalmologists to do this screening, those who have been trained in sort of interpreting these retinal images. Um, and so this is something where machine learning can actually help a lot, because you can actually train a model based on you know, uh, trained ophthalmologists annotating images to say, yes, that's a 1, that's a 3, that's a 2, that's a 5. Um, and if you train a model on board-certified ophthalmologists, you can actually train a model that is as, as effective as board-certified ophthalmologists. If you then go on to get that same training data annotated by retinal specialists who have a lot more uh, expertise and, and experience in the, these cases, you can actually train a model that is uh, on par with retinal specialists. It's kind of the gold standard of, of care in this space. It, and there are very few of those in the world. But you can all of a sudden make the screening quality be that of a retinal specialist uh, using a GPU uh, on a laptop. Um, and so we've actually partnered with uh, organizations in India, a network of Indian eye hospitals, and, and the government of Thailand, as well as France and Germany. Um, and we're sort of uh, doing lots and lots of screening every year. Uh, and then dermacyst. So dermatology is a condition where it's interesting because you actually don't need specialized equipment to sort of uh, gather data that is useful for interpreting, you know, do you have a dermatological condition or not? Uh, and so we've got a system now deployed where um, you can take a photo of something, as you see in the video, and it will give you a sense of, you know, what this might be, what are other similar looking images in sort of dermatological databases, uh, and it can help give you a sense of is this something very serious or is this something fairly benign. Um, OK. Uh, and then finally, I think deeper and broader understanding of the machine learning methods as we sort of deploy them in more places in the world is really, really important. And you know, as we've gone from doing basic research in, in machine learning to then using it in a lot of places in all of our products, we started to think about a, you know, a set of principles by which we want to you know, think about the implications of using machine learning, what considerations should we have for you know, various ways in which we might uh, apply it. Um, and we, in 2018, published a set of principles that we came up with. Uh, really, these were designed to help educate our own uh, internal teams about machine learning and things you should be thinking about as you're thinking about applying it to problems you care about. Uh, and so, for example, you know, avoid creating or reinforcing unfair bias. Often when you train these models, they're trained on uh, data from the real world. And that's often the world as uh, not the world as we'd like it to be, but the world as it is. And so it's really important when you're deploying machine learning models that you don't sort of train on data that is biased in unfair ways and then accelerate that, because now you can automate and make these decisions more rapidly. Um, so there's a bunch of techniques you can apply uh, on a sort of algorithmic basis to remove some kinds of bias. Um, and what we strive to do is sort of apply the best known current techniques, but then also do research on advancing the state of the art in these areas of bias or, for example, um, uh, accountable to people. We think you know, making models interpretable is an important aspect of that. Um, you know, being sensitive to privacy when that makes sense in the setting you're deploying it, uh, and you know, be socially beneficial. Uh, and so I, I'll point out a lot of these are sort of active areas of research. Uh, so we, you know, we've published about 200 different papers in, uh, in the last five years or so, six years, uh, related to fairness or bias, privacy, or safety. And you can see those there. OK, in conclusion, you know, I think it's pretty exciting times for computing. I think there's a change underway 
from hand-coded software systems to ones that are learned and that can interact with the world in various interesting ways and interact with people in interesting ways. Um, the modalities that computers can now sort of ingest and understand and sort of produce are growing and are, you know, I think going to make using computers much more seamless and natural. You know, a lot of times we sort of restrict ourselves to typing on a keyboard or something like that. But I think we now have the ability to talk to a computing system in a very natural way that will understand what we say. It will be able to produce a natural sounding voice in response or a nice image if that's what we asked for. And so I think that's pretty exciting. So there's tremendous opportunity for sure. Uh, but there's also a lot of responsibility. How do we sort of take this work forward, make sure that it's socially beneficial, uh, and really uh, kind of do good things in the world with it? And so with that, thank you very much. Uh, I, will, I will put up one more plug for the Slido number. There it is. Well, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you very, very much for your talk. Please don't send more questions to Slido. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. OK. It's a we'll, very nice we'll, idea, we'll but we are overwhelmed <laughs> <laughs> at this point. <laughs> Uh, so what we are going to do is we are, uh, um, I, I'm going to give you some questions. Uh, uh, some, uh, there were some trends in the questions okay. that appeared with Slido. So I'm going to ask you some of these questions. And then for those of you who made it to this auditorium, we'll, give, uh, we'll, ask, we'll take one or, or two questions from the audience. Uh, so one of the questions, is, um, uh, let, let me start with this, a question that you probably expect. OK, more data. Is it going to, to make your model better? Twice more data. Are we going to see twice as, uh, as good a performance? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a good question, and it's, a, it's not a simple answer, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we've seen that more high-quality data absolutely makes the model perform better when you have the capacity to sort of train on that larger amount of data. So it's important to think about the model's capacity. You know, sometimes you need to increase the scale of the model as well when you have more training data. We've seen uh, more data actually hurt. So if you actually get a lot of low quality data, uh, you can actually, for example, decrease the model's ability to effectively do mathematics problems or things like that. So yes. it's, it's a nuanced thing. But in general, mm -hmm. more high quality data and more capacity for the model will make the model better. Yeah. So the next question in, this, uh, um, in the slide that emerged is, OK, so what is the future of LLMs now that the vast majority of high quality training data has been exhausted? Oh, How would you react to that? I, I would disagree with that okay. assertion a bit. Uh, you know, I think we've not really begun to train mm -hmm. on, say, video that much. Okay. I mean, we've done small mm -hmm. amounts of video, but there's a huge amount of video data in the world. I think actually understanding the world through visual and audio data will be different than sort of training on a lot of language. You're going to want to do both. Right. But I don't think we've, we've really exhausted the training data in the yeah. world. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I think we still have a lot to go. Uh, multimodal models, you emphasize that in your talk. Um, do they achieve better performance on all domains than targeted models for each domain separately? Oh, you can paraphrase this question and answer yeah. a version of that question. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think in some cases they do. So mm -hmm. the question is, as you add more modalities, does that improve the performance, improve the performance on other modalities? Not. Yeah. And you hope so. And, and generally, we do see some aspects of that. Um, but I, I, you know, I think if you collect a, if you have a narrow problem and you collect a very targeted data set, that is designed to tackle that just that problem, mm -hmm. that will often you know, give you good performance on a problem. On the problem. But if you have a complicated problem or it's hard to collect very specialized data, what you want is a model that has a huge amount of knowledge of lots of different things in the world, you know, from language and from images and audio, and then to be able to apply that model to the problem you care about. And then if you have a little bit of data for a problem you care about, 
then you're going to want to start with that base model and then fine tune it or do in context learning or something like that mm -hmm. to make the performance uh, quite good. Mm -hmm. Maybe I could follow with another question, which is kind of related. Today, the cost of training large models prevents small startups from making impact. What kind of projects would individuals with less resource work on? Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, there's a really large set of problems in the machine learning domain. I, I'm going to address it more from a, you know, what interesting research can one do mm -hmm. in the, in the yes. broad area uh, where maybe you don't have access to large data centers of, of mm -hmm. compute and so on. And I think there's just a really wide open set of things. Uh, so I've mentioned the quality of data, evalu automatic evaluation of data quality, or online curriculum learning, or optimization methods, or a lot of these kinds of things can actually be demonstrated on you know, one GPU or you know, a handful of GPUs under your desk mm -hmm. and actually make pretty significant and innovative advances. You know, the original transformer work was done on eight GPUs, I think. So Interesting. Uh, that, or the sequence to sequence model for sure was eight GPUs. And so I think there's advances to be had from clever ideas, good evaluation of them, and even demonstration of them at small scale. Mm -hmm. OK. Another set of questions that we got is, is LLMs everything? Is transformers everything? What else is there? Should we be working on other kinds of uh, models? Is the mm -hmm. emphasis on LLM, LLMs uh, stifling other, other work in machine learning? Yeah, I mean, it, it is a worry, right? Like, are we crowding out other innovative mm -hmm. ideas that maybe uh, are, you know, not as fully developed, and so they don't look as good as some of the things that have been, you know, much more fully explored and were sort of, uh, you know, um, in the kind of now gentle exploration of the space around what works well, I when see. maybe something over here would work really well. You know, I think a lot of the time, uh, showing even at a small scale that some other idea is a really interesting mm -hmm. direction can be done with some modest amount of experimental evidence. Um, and I think that's an important area to go. I would say, you know, I, I tend not to use LLM because I think we're moving to a multimodal world. Okay. Uh, and I think multimodal is going to be more than just kind of the human modalities you think about, like. Uh, visual and audio mm -hmm. and language, yeah. but mm -hmm. other modalities that are mm -hmm. important in the world and, you know, like time series of interesting, you know, heart rate sensor data for healthcare applications. Yeah. There's probably 50 to 100 modalities of data you'd want to be able to deal with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I see, I just saw the, the, the clock and we've really run over time. So I would like to end here by thanking uh, Jeff Dean for his talk. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.